Dr. Rajitani. I'm actually a PGY2 at Stanford. And today I want to tell you a bit about primary care for interns, because regardless of where you go for residency, you're going to probably have clinic. And specifically, certain types of residencies will have primary care clinic. And that's what I want to talk about today. Even if you don't have primary care clinic, I think the tips that I'm going to share will be helpful uh, because they'll help you be a bit more efficient. But this is going to be a bit more catered to primary care. So what is primary care? It's a pretty big part of any residency training, uh, primarily if you do internal medicine, uh, pediatrics, oftentimes family medicine, and then there are very specifically focused primary care uh, residencies as well, where you will definitely be doing primary care. But if you do internal medicine, which is usually the most popular residency and often has the most spots, you will have a big part of your training be primary care because it's important for you to know how to take care of patients in the outpatient setting. Oftentimes, people don't even know what a primary care physician is, and what that means is primary care uh, physicians take care of patients in an outpatient setting where you see them um, X number of times a year or maybe once a year, and you follow up with all of their basic health needs. If they have diabetes, you follow up with that. If they have some form of cancer, you kind of maintain them. You may know your primary care physician because that's often the first person you go to. That's why they're called primary. The first person you go to when you have an issue. And then that person is often responsible for doing the initial workup and then passing that passing you on to someone else if they think you need an additional specialist. So that's what a primary care physician is. I took this from a kid's website because primary care physicians are present for kids, they're present for adults, they're present for elderly individuals, they're present for everyone. And if you go to a residency program in internal medicine, uh, you're going to need to do primary care because it's a big part of your training. Even if you go into a very specialized specialty like neurosurgery, vascular surgery, those individuals also have clinic. They don't have primary care clinic, but they have clinic. Um, and they often means that they're seeing patients in an outpatient setting. So the context of clinic is very different from being in a hospital. A clinic is where you often go to get your normal checkups. You might go to a cardiology clinic to get a routine echo. You might go to a primary care clinic to get your routine physical. Um, this is different from being in a hospital because anytime someone is in a hospital, they're sick and they're often sick enough that they need very intense care. But when you're in a clinic setting, you're often fine. You may have some concerns, but you're not septic. You're not tachycardic. You often are doing okay. So that's why clinic is a very different type of training. You're seeing patients in clinic for about 30 to 45 minutes. They often come in with some level of complaint. Um, they're usually not emergent. It doesn't need to be addressed something acutely. Oftentimes, they can be managed outpatient. And um, the only other thing is, even if it's less critical, I don't want you to think it's easier because when you're seeing someone in a clinic setting and specifically with primary care, you often have to address way more stuff. You often have to address their cancer screening. You need to address their diabetes. If they have that, you need to address all of their problems. Um, the other thing with primary care and outpatient therapy is that it's often focused on prevention. So much of medicine is reactive. Oh, you have a elevated white count. Maybe we'll start you on antibiotics. Oh, you're tachycardic. Maybe you need some flare fluids. But in clinic, that's oftentimes where you can be preventive. You can say, hey, your lipids are kind of high. Maybe we should think about getting you on a statin so you don't end up having a heart attack down the road, right? And so that's a big part of clinic. The patient load for clinic depends, uh, but oftentimes uh, where I am, we see about four to five patients in a half day and up to 10 full patients on a full day of clinic, which is usually from 8 a.m. to around 3 to 4 p.m. Um, for each of those patients, you need to address a big part of their whatever they need to address that day. And then you often also need to finish notes for them. So clinic days can be very, very fast paced because you often don't even have time to breathe. You just go from one patient to the next and you're going very fast. And each of them needs to have their orders in. They need to know what the plan is. You need to update them. And oftentimes they have their own issues that they want to talk about as well. So now let's get into the tips. I'm going to break this down into three categories. What I do before the patient arrives, what I do when the patient arrives, and what I do after the patient is gone. This really helps streamline clinic for me to make sure I'm time efficient and I get everything done. I'm thinking that these tips will be really helpful because these are things that I wish I knew when I was an intern. Before the patient arrives, the number one thing that I will tell you, always prep always prep. Don't think that you can just wing a patient visit. If a patient arrives, you should know exactly what they're coming in uh, with, what their previous medical conditions are. And oftentimes the way that I prep 
And this, sometimes you might think it takes some time, but when you prep, it's going to save you so much extra time on the back end. You're going to be able to navigate the visit. You're going to be able to stay on schedule. You're going to be able to finish clinic day and be ahead compared to when I don't prep, even though I didn't prep and I feel like, oh, I didn't spend as much time beforehand. Clinic day is almost always a disaster. So the way that I prep is um, I start the patient's note ahead of time. I look at the last time that the patient was seen in a clinic. If I saw them last time, I see what I did. But if I didn't see them last time, I see what the other provider did. Then I fill in everything that happened since the last time the patient was in clinic. Did they get admitted? Did they often see a urology outpatient consult? Did they see someone else? What happened? Did they get a refill of medication when they started on a new medication? I fill in a few interval events. And then in the HPI section, when I'm going to talk to them, I write down three things, just three, that I want to communicate to the patient. These are my priorities that I want to talk about for the patient. If maybe their A1C went up, or maybe they um, are having worsening creatinine, and I think they need to be started on an angiotensin receptor blocker, um, an ARB, right? Um, maybe then I need to talk to them about that. I write down three things that I want to address with them. And then oftentimes, I try to also work smart. So I look at other people's notes, and I fill in the family history of the patient and the social history for the patient. I try to be nuanced because it's so important to get to know patients. And sometimes the way I like to do it is I read up on their social history, and I try to find one nuanced fact about the patient so I can build rapport with them, maybe the name of their dog or if they like a hobby and things like that, because that can really help build rapport and that can also, often also help streamline um, the ability for you to get to know the patient well. When the patient arrives, the first thing I do is set the stage. I tell them, hey, we're either running late or we're on time. We have about 30 minutes. I know that's not a lot of time. There are certain things I want to talk about. Here are these three things. What are the three things that you would like to talk about. And notice how I often write two to three just to set the context for the patient because sometimes they can have a lot that they want to talk about and 30 minutes is just not a lot of time. And if they want to talk about more, you can say, hey, we can probably schedule another appointment, but let's address the most acute issues first. Because trust me, 30 minutes is not a lot of time and it's much better spent on one or two issues that the patient is most concerned about than 30 issues that the patient isn't concerned about. Um, so when I set the stage, they tell me what they're worried about. And when they say, hey, I want to talk about maybe some shortness of breath I'm feeling. I'm like, okay, let's talk about that. When did that start? How did that go? Um, what makes it better? What makes it worse? I get a brief HPI. And then I talk about the few things I want to talk about. And then I go into a physical exam. The physical exam is a big part of any clinic visit. But I often do a very thorough review of systems. I ask them like, hey, if they're short of breath, the big questions I want to say is like, do you have chest pain when you're short of breath? Is it worse when you're laying flat? Do you have any lower extremity edema? Have you had any vomiting blood? Like I ask very focused review of systems. And then the next thing I do for physical exam, I do a very general physical exam. I obviously listen to their heart. I listen to their lungs. I then do um, a brief musculoskeletal exam. Are they moving all four extremities? I do a brief neuro exam um, in terms of cranial nerves and I see if they're alert and oriented. But then I actually zone in on what their biggest issue is. So if they're saying that they're short of breath, then I also check for lower extremity edema. I see if they have any risk factors for a clot. If maybe they're short of breath because of heart failure, I see if they have JVD. Do they have a hepatojugular reflex? I often also take a look inside um, their mouth and see if there's any obstruction there, right? You want to do a very focused exam. If they're diabetic, you might want to screen them for neuropathy, see if their vision's okay. If they're cirrhotic, you want to see if they have jaundice. You want to see if they have spiderangiomatas. You want to see if they have pulmonary edema, right? Like you want to have a very focused exam. And that's only going to happen if you know the patient ahead of time. If you have prepped and you know what the patient has, then you can focus the exam on the things that you know are important. And then the other thing that you often need to do when the patient arrives is the maintenance and prevention part of a clinic. I am lucky because I have a program that has a very strict thing and they actually spell out exactly what we need to do for maintenance and prevention. We need to document all of their immunizations. If they're due for a new immunization, it actually is written, right? Like, so you get your Tdap booster every 10 years. And so if they're due for it, I offer it to them. If they're interested, great, I give it to them. If they're not, then I don't give it to them. And oftentimes, um, I also screen for hepatitis, HIV, and all those things, assume the patient consents for them.
So this is the immunization part. The other thing for maintenance is oftentimes patients should also get maintenance tests, right? So many of you may know colonoscopy screening is now every 10 years between 45 and 75 if you get a colonoscopy, but you can also get a fit test every year. Now, some people often need to be screened for hepatitis B if they're at high risk. Um, they need to be screened for HIV if they're at high risk. They often need to be screened for diabetes with an A1C or a lipid panel, right? And so I check ahead of time and I say, hey, do we need to order these lab? If the patient's okay with it, and I say, hey, we're going to get your lipids today. We're going to get a creatinine. We're going to make sure your kidneys are doing okay. We're going to check your blood count because you're on a blood thinner, and I want to make sure you're not bleeding. And then we're going to check an A1C to make sure your diabetes stay well. Um, and so that often helps me with the plan. And as the patient is leaving, I summarize the plan. I say, here's what we talked about. Today, we're going to get these labs. I want you to get this imaging of your chest. You said you were short of breath. I want to see if there's any fluid in your lungs. If there is fluid, um, I'm going to probably start you on a medication and I'll call you and I'll call that in. And then the only other thing we talked about today is that we're going to start you on these medications, right? So notice that I summarize the plan. And when I summarize the plan, it's very important that you make sure the patient knows what we're going to do, right? If the blood count comes back high, what are you going to do? If the blood count comes back low and they're anemic, what are you going to do, right? And if you know these things in your head, when those labs do come back, it's going to be much easier. Um, the other thing is if they're getting any new medications, where are they going to pick them up? Um, and oftentimes, are you going to refill them and are you going to renew them? I refill and renew all the patient's meds the moment they see me, just so they have enough meds until the next time they see me. And then the next thing I tell the patient is if there's something I'm worried about, for example, if, if they're saying they're short of breath, I say, hey, if you have chest pain or your shortness of breath worsens and you have a home pulse oximeter and you're less than 90%, I want you to go to the emergency room. By setting those contingencies, you're setting yourself up for a great clinic visit because you're saying, hey, I think you're looking good. Here are the things I'm worried about. If these things happen, I want you to go to the ED because you might need to be admitted to the hospital. And the last thing I often mention is, hey, I'll see you back in six months. And um, when I see you back, here's what I'm going to do. Right as the patient's leaving, I place all the essential orders. I place all the labs. I place all the imaging. And then um, the only other thing is I often write down the things that I want to make sure to follow up on by the next time they're seen in clinic. So if I'm getting an A1C, I want to make sure the next person knows, hey, check their A1C. I just ordered it today. Um, hey, next time they come in, make sure you get a low-dose CT scan. They're due for an annual um, lung cancer screening. Um, and then, for example, let's say today, We've talked about the patient's um, incontinence, and the fact is that they have often have a lot of urgent continence, and I just started them on oxybutynin. If that's not helpful, by the next time they come in, maybe we need to consider a urology consult. So I wrote that all at the bottom of the note. So the next person who's taking over, and maybe next time I'm not able to see the patient, at least someone else is able to fill down um, that patient's care. After the patient has left, um, the next thing I often do is try to fill in as much of the note as I can. Uh, with whatever meds the patient is taking, their active issues. Um, the other thing I often do is do a very warm handoff. So let's say if I referred the patient to cardiology or if I referred the patient to urology, I often manually reach out to the urology colleague because it's very easy for me to know who it is um, because my clinic is at the VA and all people are on teams. And I say, hey, I referred my patient to the urology clinic. Let me know if you have any issues. Here's what I'm concerned about. And oftentimes I try to finish the note and then move on to the next patient. Again, you do this 10 times throughout the day. It's very important that you stay efficient because if you fall behind, I guarantee you, you will regret it. Um, if I don't, if I can't finish the note, that's fine. Leave the unfinished note and come back to it later. The worst thing you can do on clinic day is try to finish your note and fall behind because the more you fall behind, the more patients are often upset, the, the less likely you are to provide good care. And oftentimes you're not able to um, do everything that you're supposed to do. So hopefully all of these tips show you just how to have hopefully a better clinic experience. And these are things that have definitely helped me. Um, and so if you like this video, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.